Hey guys, welcome back. Um, today's, uh, this is for Wednesday, uh, the 18th of March. Um, so hopefully yesterday you found something productive to do with your time, uh, so, or U.S. history related. Um, I think it was in uh, an email that we had gotten from, I think, Mr. O'Leary saying that uh, our AP test should still be happening, whether or not it happens the way that we were planning on it happening with uh, showing up to school and doing everything in person. I'm not sure if that's going to be the case. Uh, there was supposed to be some news that's sent out in uh, the end of the week, I guess, regarding this, but I'm not quite sure what that'll be. It sounds like we'll still have it, but it might be in a different format uh, than uh, previously thought. So I guess stay tuned on that. But again, uh, keep working on the review, keep going forward with that, keep pushing the ball forward on, on that side of things. Um, and what we're going to end up doing uh, today is uh, talking through the first half of Chapter 36. Uh, we weren't going to do homework on this uh, because it was supposed to fall right during the middle of the musical. Uh, we're still not going to do the homework on it uh, because uh, I had already planned on doing this. So uh, we'll, we'll do it this way. Uh, I'll basically spend today and tomorrow going through going through the chapter and then uh, probably on Friday there will be a uh, there'll be a separate activity about the information in the chapter then we'll go through 37 in the same way next week uh, for part of the week so uh, with that being said there are a couple documents on the Google classroom page uh, there is a master copy of the notes that I'm sharing with you right now uh, there is also a blank copy where you can kind of use as a note-taking sheet. Uh, so I would encourage that. Um, you could do that as, I, I would encourage you to do that as, as you follow along. So hopefully you've got that in front of you. If not, you can pause the video and get that and then start it back up. So uh, we're going to start here with uh, Chapter 36, like I said, but post-war economy. So with the post-war economy, with the economy right at the end of World War II, uh, the economy is kind of firing on all cylinders at this point. Uh, there is a big, uh, big economic growth that happens as a result of World War II. Uh, remember, we've got this kind of question that we had asked ourselves: What ends up pulling us out of the Great Depression? Is it the New Deal? Is it the is it World War II? I think it's probably a combination of both. But uh, if you look at the employment numbers. Uh, unemployment was still very, very high uh, into the double digits before we joined into the war. Uh, so we really probably owe it to uh, World War II uh, for finally digging us out of this Great Depression. But then uh, what happens when we get out of the war? What happens when we come back? So that's where we're kind of getting into. So uh, in 1947, the first point here uh, is a, a law that gets passed uh, that's on your sheet called the Taft-Hartley Act. Taft-Hartley Act. Um, the Republicans end up uh, passing this law. Uh, the president at the time was Harry Truman. He's a Democrat. Uh, Harry Truman vetoed it, uh, but the Republicans overrode the veto. Um, this Taft-Hartley this Taft-Hartley Act. Uh, kind of counteracts some of the protections that have been put in place, for, uh, I guess, on behalf of labor unions. Uh, the Taft-Hartley Act outlaws what they call closed businesses, where everybody has to be in a union uh, to work there. Uh, closed shop is sometimes what that's called. <clears throat> uh, so it outlaws that. Uh, it also uh, makes unions uh, are liable for any damages that... Uh, kind of result from disputes. Uh, so if there's like a workplace issue that I guess uh, boils over into violence, then the union has to pay for that. Uh, somebody's got to pay. Uh, and then uh, union leaders also are required to take a non-communist oath, which is uh, something that classically unions have dealt with is communism and socialism in there, uh, in the ranks. So these unions have to um, have to take those, uh, the, the non-communist oath to basically pledge their allegiance to uh, democracy and capitalism and all that stuff. So Taft-Hartley Act, uh, definitely an anti-union piece, uh, anti-worker piece, uh, closing out after World War II. Uh, there's also another law that gets passed uh, that's the next point on there called the Servicemen's Readjustment Act, and that was passed in 1944. Uh, it is more commonly known as the GI Bill, the GI Bill of Rights. 
Uh, this GI Bill is still in force today in some capacity. Uh, it is uh, basically providing money for soldiers who are coming back from uh, the war. Uh, provides money to those soldiers to uh, be able to go to school, uh, to get uh, education, college education more specifically nowadays. Uh, but if you serve, you get to go to school uh, and use use those uh, benefits. Now, uh, the last thing that I got to mention is is talking about the expansion of the economy. So I've got a chart here to show you. So uh, in the 1950s, but also uh, 60s, uh, the economy is growing uh, pretty rapidly uh, at a rate that we hadn't seen in a long time. Uh, pretty crazily, uh, the incomes are rising, uh, the middle class expands, uh, and then uh, the last point that I have on here to say is that uh, at this point, Americans account for uh, 40% of the entire wealth of the world. 40% uh, of the entire wealth of the world is in America which is very noteworthy. Uh, we come out of this, uh, this world war uh, with, like I said, firing on all cylinders, and we uh, kind of take our place as the economic leader in the world uh, as a result of this. So uh, you can see on this chart, you've got uh, GDP, gross domestic product, which is just kind of, a, 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 I guess, a sign of how big our economy is, how our economy is growing. Uh, the GDP rises throughout the 1950s pretty steadily. Um, there's just a couple blips where they're just minor, minor, uh, minor recessions, but uh, those are very short recessions as far as we are concerned. Uh, just usually half a year or uh, nine months or so, which is pretty short uh, as far as recessions go. So nothing big, uh, pretty, pretty calm times, but just a large amount of economic growth. So uh, we will go on to the next thing here. Uh, the next thing has uh, has to deal with population changes. The next heading uh, under population changes, the first thing to mention is another thing over here in, uh, in my next picture called the Sun Belt. Um, and we'll talk about the Sun Belt uh, and then we'll talk about the Rust Belt. <clears throat> so the Sun Belt is uh, give or take 15 states. This uh, picture only has uh, 11 on there. Uh, but you could include like Arkansas and Tennessee and uh, Nevada and North Carolina into that Sun Belt. Uh, so it's an area stretching kind of across the bottom edge of the country. Uh, it is uh, the southern part of the U.S. Uh, all the way out from, uh, yeah, the southern part, southeastern U.S., all the way out to California. Um, and the population in this area after the, after the Second World War uh, the population here is growing twice as fast as it is in the Northeast. So every place is gaining population for the most part. Uh, here it's growing twice as fast as anywhere else. Uh, so it is, uh, it is just a lot of economic, or a lot of economic growth, a lot of population growth. Now, some of the reasons why people end up uh, moving down to the Sun Belt. Uh, there is a lot of jobs there. Uh, it is a decent place to live, uh, better climate. Uh, as you guys can probably uh, attest to, it does not snow, uh, and sometimes the snow can be not so nice, uh, as we know in New York. So uh, they end up moving down to the south to get away from climate issues, to get away from poor job uh, markets, uh, that sort of thing, as well as lower taxes. Uh, these, northern, these northern states had high taxes, and, and down in the south it was cheaper to live. Uh, there were certain areas that were hard hit by this, uh, the main area being uh, the Rust Belt. Uh, so you've got the Rust Belt over here uh, in uh, kind of around the Great Lakes. Uh, New York is kind of considered to be in the Rust Belt, not all of New York, though. Uh, specifically, areas like Buffalo and Rochester are kind of in the Rust Belt, but other places not so much. Uh, the Rust Belt is described as the Rust Belt because people are uh, moving out of that area and uh, most of the stuff in that area or the big industries in that area were metal producing, steel, um, iron ore, that sort of thing. So uh, when you end up having uh, steel that's been left outside for a long time, uh, it ends up rusting, as we know. So uh, that is kind of uh, the, the nickname that's given to it is the Rust Belt. Um, hard hit in this area. There's a loss of uh, funds, a loss of population, just a loss of loss of a lot of whatever was drawing people into this area. Uh, people are kind of leaving at this point. 
there is also um, a, a difference uh, that pops up with home ownership. Uh, home ownership becomes kind of a popular thing, uh, specifically with uh, white people. Uh, so with uh, Caucasian uh, Caucasian people, uh, the desire to own the to the desire to own their own home is a very big desire, uh, and so people are moving out from cities into uh, suburbs to be able to afford their own homes, and uh, they can afford them at this point because the economy is doing really well. Uh, so you move into your own house, uh, and so you end up uh, end up setting up there. Uh, this creates a problem that I will. Uh, I think I mentioned on that sheet uh, called white flight. Uh, and so white flight is this idea where um, all the white people are moving to suburbs, leaving uh, all of uh, minorities to live in cities. And uh, with the white people went a lot of uh, the affluence, the money at that time. Uh, so you end up with a lot of the taxes that leave uh, and go out to the suburbs. So then that leaves uh, inner cities with with basically nothing uh, and a lot of needs to provide for. So uh, African Americans oftentimes move up to this or from the South into these abandoned cities uh, or these abandoned parts of cities as well as other minorities. Uh, but it, it affirms the idea that, or I guess the trend in American history that white people end up moving out to the suburbs and um, minorities end up living uh, in higher percentages in cities. Now, that's not entirely accurate 100% of the time, obviously, but it is a trend that we see. So that's ultimately kind of an issue there. Now, last thing that we got to mention here is uh, the baby boom. I have a picture here. Uh, so something that you guys undoubtedly have heard of before and uh, know of, because uh, we talk about uh, baby boomers all the time, uh, some more than others recently, um, and no, I'm not a baby boomer. I'm a millennial. So Ryan, don't make that comment as I'm sure you were about to. Um, so <laughs> the baby boom is, uh, these, uh, I guess 15, 20 years, uh, following world war II, uh, when there is a massive increase in the, uh, birth rate, uh, the amount of children being born every year, uh, goes up by over a million uh, from the time during the middle of the war. So you end up with uh, 15, or you end up with, uh, yeah, during the baby boom, 50 million babies were born. Uh, 50 million over the course of, uh, over the course of 15 years. Um, there are uh, birth rates uh, that are just, just exploding here. So the chart just shows this, uh, this big blip here. Uh, that is in uh, the 19, late 1940s, early 1950s, and then 1960s as well. Uh, the baby boom would have ended in 1964. Uh, so that'd be the final year of the baby boom. Uh, it is an 18-year generation, which is usually how we mark generations. But you can see it's this massive blip. Uh, by the mid-1970s, population has actually dropped. Uh, the birth rate has dropped to the point where it's not going to be sustainable anymore. Uh, but then it creeps up from there. Uh, and you can see here uh, towards the end, it's actually been dropping uh, recently. Uh, they figure that uh, the average American family needs to have uh, 2.1 children on average to sustain the birth rate. I'm not sure where we're at with how many are actually being born. Uh, but we have a lot more people in America today, and we're still having less children being born every year than during the height of the baby boom, which is noteworthy, I think. Okay, so I think that's all I've got for that one. Now, post-war decisions. Um, post-war decisions. We have, a, oh, I've got another picture here. Never mind. Uh, this looks like a stressful day. Uh, I have seen nothing but uh, stressful posts on Facebook about how, how parents need to deal with their kids during this coronavirus time and how, how we don't know how people do it when they have to go. Like, we don't know how teachers do it. I don't care about any of that. But this looks stressful. Okay, this itself. Uh, there are uh, 15 children laying on this bed, and this lady has to take care of them all. Uh, I think I would lose my mind. Okay, now I digress. Uh, so that's the baby boom. Um, okay, uh, on to post-war decisions. Uh, as the war is wrapping up, there is a need for uh, FDR as well as the other leaders in Europe uh, to kind of decide how the war is going to end and what's going to be the plan going forward. Uh, so we have a meeting here 
uh, at a conference uh, in uh, Potsdam at a place called Yalta, uh, which is on your paper there. Uh, so at a place called Yalta, we have uh, this uh, conference. Um, I think it was, no, it's not Potsdam. Potsdam's a different con or a different, I'm sorry, I'm totally messing them up. Uh, Potsdam is a different place. Potsdam was a different conference that happened. Uh, the Potsdam conference was where Harry Truman found out that he had the atomic bomb that he could use. Uh, but this is Yalta. Yalta, uh, I'm forgetting where it is. It's not in Potsdam because Potsdam is a separate city. I'm sorry. Um, so uh, at Yalta, uh, there are plans that are made for the occupation of Germany. Uh, Germany is set up into, uh, into different, uh, I guess, uh, spheres, I guess you might say. Uh, you guys probably remember from Global that there's uh, four different countries that get control of certain parts of Germany. Uh, there is the Soviet side, uh, and then there is kind of the other three that work together, America, England, and France. Uh, and so we end up with East and West Germany eventually. Uh, but uh, the plan is made kind of here that each power, uh, each of these allied powers, will be in control of a certain part of Germany and have the occupation of Germany. Uh, they had also agreed to free elections in certain places in Eastern Europe. Uh, I have written down here Poland, Bulgaria, and Romania. Uh, so free elections there. Uh, Joseph Stalin was supposed to allow this to happen, but he ended up, uh, I believe, invading those territories before they actually could have elections. Um, and they also end up creating uh, the framework for a peacekeeping organization called the United Nations. Uh, which uh, we will talk about more in a little bit here. Um, the USSR, their main goal here, as I mentioned on my master copy, if you're looking at that, uh, the USSR sought, uh, they're trying to look to uh, kind of build a, a buffer around their area, uh, around their territory, try to build a set of uh, states that are set up around them that will be uh, the same sort of uh, country, same sort of government, a group of friendly countries that they can kind of protect themselves with. It's a it's a barrier between uh, between Russia or between the USSR and the rest of uh, between the rest of or between the USSR and the rest of Europe that are democratic. So it's this boundary. So here you've got uh, in this picture here uh, the big three they call them Stalin, Roosevelt, and uh, Winston Churchill. Um, okay, let's talk about the next thing here: uh, the United Nations. So on this here, you've got a picture of the, U, the first uh, meeting of the General Assembly uh, at the United Nations. Uh, it opened in uh, 1945 in April. Uh, there were 50 nations that were represented that created the charter. Uh, and there were five countries that were in particular called out to be kind of the leaders in this, uh, the leaders in this uh, group. Uh, they were called the Security Council. The Security Council uh, and they were uh, the United States, uh, Britain, France, Soviet Union, and China. Uh, so those five are uh, essentially the most powerful countries in the world at this point, at least under our understanding. Uh, so they get veto powers under this United Nations. Uh, everybody could say no, or everybody could say one thing, and one of those part, one of those countries could say something else, and uh, it could be scratched. So. Uh, that side of it would be uh, a little bit uh, a little bit powerful for us as we're involved in that, but also for those other countries. So the Security Council, but then also the uh, General Assembly, which is pictured in this uh, in this picture here, uh, where you have uh, a majority of the other countries who are all kind of represented there. Um, the Senate end up uh, ratifying the uh, agreement to join the. Uh, United Nations, the Charter, uh, they end up ratifying that uh, pretty overwhelmingly in uh, 1945 in July. So the war is wrapping up at that point, but they end up uh, advocating for this thing to be passed. Uh, that is a very different story than what had happened after World War I. Uh, as we know, World War I ended up with the United States dis disagreeing over the Treaty of Versailles, uh, whether or not we wanted to join the United Nations, whether or not we wanted to commit to being involved, the League of Nations, sorry. Uh, whether or not we wanted to be com committed to being involved in world affairs, uh, this shows a bit of a shift where we are understanding that we no longer can stay away. Uh, we have to more or less uh, show up and, and participate. 
So it's a shift there. Okay, I think I am, uh, okay, this will be our next thing. So we got to talk about, um, got to talk about the Cold War beginnings, how the Cold War ramps up here. So uh, there is a uh, doctrine that gets brought up called containment. Okay, containment. Uh, that should be on your paper there. So containment is uh, described by uh, a guy named George Kennan. George Kennan. Uh, and so containment is is this desire. Again, you probably remember this from Google or from World, uh, but it's this desire to um, try to uh, keep the uh, USSR in their box, so to speak. I think of it as like a you know, Pandora's box, you take the top off of it and everything just pops out, you know, or whatever. I don't know. Uh, but it is uh, a, a dangerous, uh, dangerous thing we view it as. So uh, we don't want the Soviet Union to go around and keep taking over places. Uh, that is not something that we're really advocating to happen or really looking forward to happening. Uh, so we are trying to contain them. Uh, we can contain them by watching them and making sure that they don't uh, spread making sure that they, that they don't take over new countries and fighting them whenever they do. So uh, Harry Truman ends up embracing this idea of containment uh, in 1947. Uh, he proposes what's called the Truman Doctrine. Uh, the Truman Doctrine is uh, referred to, uh, I guess it's kind of his, his main foreign policy goal uh, going forward. Uh, but the idea with the Truman Doctrine is that uh, it is the United States job uh, to help out any country who's fighting communism or resisting communist aggression. So it is the, it is the United States job to help any country out who's trying to resist uh, the uh, expansion of communism into their territory. So that Truman Doctrine kind of guides us, um, kind of guides us forward as we would go. Um, now, we also have a plan called the Marshall Plan, which uh, shows up here. Uh, in post-World War II uh, Europe. Uh, the Marshall Plan, proposed by Secretary of State George Marshall, um, George Marshall ends up uh, trying to set up a plan uh, to help out Europe and help them recover. Uh, if you uh, know much about World War II, almost all or a lot of the fighting ended up happening in Europe. Uh, so the recovery that is happening there, uh, we viewed the recovery in Europe as essential uh, to stopping the spread of communism. If we are able to go in and uh, help out these uh, countries that are trying to resist communist aggression, if we go in and help them out and stabilize them, then they won't have any need to turn to the communists. Uh, so we are able to uh, go in and, and help them out in that way. So we are trying to provide aid for, for specifically in Europe, those, those countries who are trying to avoid communism uh, or trying to resist communism. Uh, now, for our part, we also offer it to uh, communist satellites, uh, any, uh, any aid that uh, the Soviet Union needed, we also offered it to them. Uh, so the Soviet Union and their allies, we offered it to them. Uh, the Soviets refused to accept our money. So uh, we did offer it to everybody, but uh, they were only accepted by uh, most of the time, those democratic countries. Uh, the Marshall Plan, in the end, ultimately gives out uh, $12 billion, $12.5 billion uh, to uh, 16 European countries, just, again, to try to stabilize them. Now, last thing here that I've got uh, pulled up over here on my screen is uh, NATO. Uh, so we join a, uh, an alliance, essentially, um, called uh, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, NATO. Uh, so NATO ends up being uh, really the first peacetime alliance that we've ever been a part of. Uh, if you remember, we've got this uh, precedent that's been going on since uh, George Washington. Uh, George Washington in his farewell address said to avoid entangling alliances, uh, meaning don't get involved in other people's business uh, in fewer words, or I guess more words, but simpler words. So uh, avoid entangling alliances. We had kind of followed that all the way through. Uh, we had gotten involved into the wars, uh, into these world wars, but we got out uh, as soon as we were done. We isolated ourselves afterwards. Uh, this time, we are taking a different stance. Uh, we join NATO. Uh, essentially what it is, it's a pact that says if one of us is attacked, uh, everybody will jump in and defend them. Uh, that is an alliance in a nutshell. So this is America joining an alliance, which is 
uh, a big a big shift in terms of how America is uh, kind of operating in the world. So uh, the Soviet Union is going to end up creating their own uh, called the Warsaw Pact, which you uh, probably also know about. Uh, so that is uh, kind of the deal there. So uh, we have rivaling alliances that will end up uh, showing up here. So um, I think that's all I've got for or Cold War Beginnings. We'll get into the next uh, few things tomorrow and we'll wrap this up. Uh, we're at 25 and a half minutes right now, so I'm in a good spot to end up here. Um, again, uh, you should uh, hopefully, you know, use use this time wisely. Um, I would encourage you again, uh, you know, try to take some time. Uh, if you, if you uh, are somebody who would benefit from a schedule, uh, I had talked to a couple people about this. You could read one chapter in a review book every day. Uh, and the chapter in the review book is like 10 pages, maybe 10. Uh, and they're short and they're easier to read and uh, shouldn't take you that long. Uh, devote 10 minutes or maybe not 10 minutes, but devote 15, 20 minutes to it every day. Uh, you've got the time. Uh, you know, that might be something smart to do or say, OK, every minute, every day I'm going to spend 30 minutes on my review packet, something like that. Uh, or I'm going to watch a crash course video every day. Uh, definitely be thinking about that. Uh, I probably will, uh, I, I might, if I can figure out how to do it, might assign some crash course videos for you guys to uh, watch and uh, respond to uh, some of the later ones, but we'll see what happens. Uh, but again, we are presented with an opportunity. It's a challenge, but it's also an opportunity. So if we look at it like that, uh, we might we might be able to benefit from it in the long run. Again, um, I understand that you've got other stuff going on, and, and by by all means, this is not the, the most important thing in your lives right now, which is your safety and uh, health. So uh, as long as you got those knocked out, uh, I guess I can't complain too much, but I wouldn't mind you working on my stuff. So uh, I think that's all I got for you. Um, I will, uh, there's no responses or anything to do today. So uh, I'll be back tomorrow with another video uh, talking about uh, the next few points in this lesson. Uh, so then we can go forward from there. Um, so hopefully we uh, get to another day, get to survive another day, and I will uh, add to my counter up there. So uh, take it easy. Uh, enjoy the rest of the day. See ya.